The song starts with some mushy, uncanny orchestra and choir sounds generated by AI. For this, I think I used Google's Music LM app. People say AI art is coming for human artists, which I think is true to an extent, but at this stage, AI-generated music is so flawed that I would call it more of a distinct style than a replacement. When photography was invented, people thought painting would die, but really we just got another art form and people still paint. Early photographs have a very distinctive look because of the technological limitations of the time, and a lot of people like that old look. I would say the same goes for old film grain, or vinyl, or tape warble, stuff like that. I think AI is in a very flawed early stage that will tie the art to this moment in time, and I think some people will look back with some fondness. That tends to be the trend with technology anyway. There's a lot more to be said about AI art, and this video is going to be long enough, so I'll save a longer discussion for another time. I'll just say that I definitely have sympathy for the people who will be replaced by AI. I also think it's sort of inevitable, and I think humans will still make the best art. It'll be a painful transition for some people. I like to think that my use of this early stage flawed AI fits into the themes of Opraville. It makes me feel like I'm using it for what it is, not as a cheap way to replace a human. Anyway, after the AI-generated section, I start with a bass riff, which is just a sine wave played on my seaboard through my Frank Hertz pedal. If you want to know more about that, stay tuned, I'll release a video about it. It's just too much to explain here. <laughs> I have a confession though. When I made the Frank Hertz guitar pedal, I did all my testing by plugging in this guitar into this amp. Uh, it turns out I made a very fragile circuit and it sounds like garbage through anything else. This bass line originally had tons of noise on it, so I used a really heavy filter online to take most of it out. If you listen closely, you can still hear some swirling in the background where the noise removal didn't do very well. After that, I introduced some drums that are sampled from the Atari. And then I introduce a guitar riff that kind of follows the bass. It probably doesn't sound like guitar much anymore. The way I made my guitar sound like that was by performing something called a wavelet transform and doing some, I guess you could think of it as image processing. The wavelet transform takes an audio file and makes it into a frequency versus time graph. Each pixel's color tells you how much of a particular frequency is present at a given time. For example, uh, this graph is telling us the pitch is going up and down between 1000 and 3000 Hertz. So after taking the wavelet transform, what I do to get my guitar to sound so weird is I set a threshold. And if the pixel value, which represents the presence of a frequency, isn't strong enough, I just set it to zero. So in image processing, people just call that thresholding. That means I essentially delete all the quiet frequencies and only keep the loudest ones. I think it turned out sounding pretty cool. Next, the vocals come in. Uniform. In class, the dark bottom bunk of an empty door. For every voice, I copied the sound and applied a hard pitch correction to one and kept the other one natural. That's what gives them this phasing sort of sound. Then I slap my guitar strings while it's plugged into my interferometer to get a hi-hat sound. That's another instrument that takes a while to explain, so I'll leave it to another video. After that, I do a little frequency sweep with a function generator and come in with another guitar tone. This one's a little hard to explain, 
So if you don't know about impulse responses, uh, feel free to check out for a little bit. I wanted to play with some impulse responses that have the same frequency content as a Dirac delta, but with different phase profiles. You might know that a simple Dirac delta impulse contains every frequency, but so does white noise, and so does a chirp. The only difference between these signals is the phases of their frequencies. So while most impulse responses change the magnitude of the sine waves that constitute a signal, white noise and chirps and direct deltas only affect the phase. Well, this guitar is the result of convolving a pretty normal guitar tone with a small section of white noise. It actually gives it some character, like it's being played in a tiny, empty room. Later, I convolve a synth sound with a chirp, and I'll point out when that happens. I'm thinking about making a video about impulse responses, actually, because they're pretty interesting. It just takes a while to explain them. All right, moving on. Once in a while, deck talk will pop up, but I've covered it in earlier videos, and it's really not the star of this song. So if you want to know more, just check out my earlier videos. You and me. For this song, a more prominent artificial voice would be this one. This is made from an app called Pink Trombone. I think it's made to show how the vocal tract works, uh, but to make it sing, I tried my best to make it say the vowels I wanted, and then I just pitch corrected it. Maybe there's a Pink Trombone virtuoso out there who can make it sing beautifully using only the app. If you know this person, or you are this person, make yourself known. The world needs you. From there, we drift into the first chorus, which brings back the fake AI orchestra and introduces my stroboscope. The stroboscope is essentially just a strobe light, but I think this one was made before LEDs were common. This one has a neon bulb, which is capable of turning on and off thousands of times per second. That wouldn't work with a normal bulb, because the filament would need to heat up and cool down in order for it to produce light, and that process just takes way too long. This neon bulb is actually using quantum physics to almost instantly turn on and off. For those of you who've seen my Frank Hertz video, uh, check out these bands of light in the neon tube. What do you think's going on there? Anyway, for the chorus, I looked up all the frequencies I needed to hit in order to switch the chords. Then I pointed my neon bulb at my interferometer's photodiode, which measures light and turns it into sound. Now I just need to turn these dials to the correct places at the correct time to hit all the frequencies I need to make the chords. Here's what that sounded like. The vocals that are played over this part are from a vocal synthesis program called Utau. There are tons of user-made voice banks to choose from, but I just went with the default called Defoco. Apparently, she likes rice and does not like Daruma dolls, so I tried to keep that in mind as I wrote vocal parts for her. This program was kind of a pain to get working. I made this part a while ago, but I remember I had to switch my computer to Japanese for some reason to get it to work, and then I had to get this plugin to translate from Romaji to Hiragana because Defoco only speaks Japanese, so this plugin takes vowels and consonants in English and translates them to Japanese. There really isn't a one-to-one -one matchup between English and Japanese, so I just had to try my best to get it sounding like she was speaking English. It's really more like chopped up Japanese made to sound like English. So after the first chorus, I stick my EM microphone up to my phone to get some sciency EM background noise, and I have AI generate this drum beat. So the next verse comes in, and I'm now realizing that I forgot to mention the kick and snare that aren't from Atari. Usually I use my graphics synth to do the drum sounds, but in this song I only used it for the snare. I also put some bit crusher on there to make it kind of crackly. The kick drum is just me tapping my phone while recording a voice memo. 
Sometimes I record song ideas on my phone, and I noticed that when I tapped my finger against it, uh, it actually sounded like a pretty decent kick. Anyway, the second verse continues to build, and you can start to hear some crackling sounds. That's coming from the stroboscope set to a super low frequency, which I slide up to make the chords. As the stroboscope is playing, I run my synth through this magnetic card reader. I think it was originally meant to be a teaching tool, but Ever since Heinbach featured it as a good way to make lo-fi sounds, it's been pretty hard to come by. Well, I think you can get the module pretty easy, but finding the actual magnetic cards for me was pretty tough. I did a little circuit bending and added this knob in the back so I could slow it down for dramatic effect. I think I only used this knob for this little tiny part. So probably not a good use of time putting that in there. But that's life. When you're doing something you've never done before, which is the case for pretty much everything on this album, you end up hitting a lot of dead ends. Anyway, we bring back the guitar that was convolved with a little static, and I introduce that synth that I mentioned earlier, the one convolved with a chirp. For those who don't know, a chirp is just when you sweep a sine wave through all the frequencies. For the impulse response, I sweep from high to low, which spreads out the frequencies within the synth such that the high ones come first and the low ones come last. This chorus has a lot more energy than the first one, but then drops the energy down to almost nothing. We get more of that static guitar uh, with some subtle pitch effects here and there, and then we slowly start bringing in the other instruments. Here's a fun little detail. The buildup into the next vocal part is a sonification of a sorting algorithm, courtesy of the YouTube channel Music Combo. I really like how my vocals turned out here, but I don't remember how I got them to sound so chunky. I'll pick you the shallow. A heart throbbing shallow. Think tonight you'll fall in love. Maybe I should write this stuff down. So, the buildup finally releases the tension into some big chords played by a Tesla coil. I wanted to get this played out of a big Tesla coil, but the scope of this project was already getting way out of hand, uh, so I just got this tiny one, and I did some mixing tricks to make it sound bigger. Then I give the Tesla coil some slight backup with uh, more plasma. This uh, plasma pedal, to be specific. I found that it looks coolest when you crank it, but it sounds coolest when you starve it. There's a better example of that coming up in a later song. Here it just sounds kind of weak. Then we bring back the synth that's going through the caliphone to start to slowly release the energy. It was kind of fun to mess with the card as it went through the reader. It gave it kind of like a intentional warble. Also during this part, the Frank Hertz bass comes back with some wobbling sounds. This is definitely not the most efficient way to do this. But the wobbling you hear from the Frank Hertz bass is actually the result of two notes beating to the tempo of the song. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, a beat frequency appears when two similar frequencies are interacting with each other. It's the sound you hear when you tune your guitar strings against each other 
and right before they're in tune, they do this wobbly sound. So all I had to do was calculate what frequencies I needed to play in order to make it sound like the correct bass frequency was wobbling to the beat. I really like how the bass turned out on this song, so I'll make an isolated track video if you're interested. I'll make an isolated track video for a couple of other sounds too. After this uh, sort of chill section, a uh, robotic guitar comes in. Actually, this robotic guitar was supposed to be the bedrock of the song, but as the song grew, it nestled into the outro and only a couple other small moments. I'll definitely make an isolated track video for the robotic guitar, because it's hard to appreciate what it really sounds like with all these other sounds going on. To me, it almost sounds like I am listening to a fake guitar from like a MIDI keyboard, but the actuators and the imperfections of the real world give it a lot more character. This guitar, uh, which was made by Demon Vladimir, by the way, it's capable of playing songs that couldn't possibly be played by a single human. So I tried to lean into that when I wrote a part for it. What you're hearing is one take from this robotic guitar. And for all the humans out there, I challenge you to try to play this in one take. But before you do that, you might want to check out Demon Vladimir's channel so you know what you're up against. Anyway, the other instruments die out, and I let the robotic guitar shine all by itself for a moment before I bring back the AI-generated orchestra one last time to end the song. That's it. If you'd like to hear the full song without me interrupting it, I'll put a link in the description. Alright, see you next time.